The production of this video was made possible by donors to the Orchestration Online Patreon Initiative. Please consider adding your support to the creation of free educational internet resources by visiting our Patreon page linked below. Hey there, this is your orchestration tutor, Thomas Goss, bringing you the third lecture in our series of lectures on Berlioz's Symphony Fantastique, the third lecture of the first movement. We left off with the music coming to this lovely little C major chord at the end of Berlioz's Reverie. Now recall, Berlioz has just stated his idee fix, his obsessive theme, which he's going to develop across this entire symphony. This was the very first statement that we just went through, plus a bit of development. But all in all, the music has this slightly dreamy quality to it. Now he's going to react, right? So this is his passion. We just saw the reverie, now here's the passion. <laughs> so. The music rips upwards to this chord in the middle strings, and we're left with this really, really beautiful tutti chord, and you just have to hand it to Berlioz. He really did explore the possibilities, and he did it in a way that's easier to play for the orchestra than you might think, right? So all of these string instruments are running upwards to a place where it would just be easy for them to play a single note, right? And this is why the first violins are not involved, because they're going to be playing these E octaves, which enclose this D flat right in here of the second violins, changing to an F. So we're starting off with this beautiful big G diminished chord, resolving to a G seventh chord. For the strings, pretty easy getting everything down beautifully in sync right in here, all this detaché bowing. You have a situation where it's just very easy for the violas and the cellos to go down, up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down, up, right? But the second violins are going to have to go down, down, up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down, up, right? It's just a very simple thing. Bowing out the parts, what will happen is the concertmaster might make the suggestion and then when the second violin section leader takes over, then they will follow that along and add any particular bowings that need being put in there. But if you look at it, going on to this more complex section right in here, Berlioz has made it totally easy for them, right? Everybody is getting the same bowing on each beat, at least for these upper strings. The basses don't really have to worry because, like, you know, very simple, down, down, up, down, up, down, up, and so on. So that's all really obvious. And it's not really until you get to here where the bowing scheme changes. These are all individually bowed, but that's all really simple. Down, up, down, up, down, and then down, up, down. So it all comes out even in the end. Well, I'm getting a little ahead of myself right in here. Let's go back to this... <laughs> lovely scoring. We just talked about how the first violins enclose the second violins. Notice that Berlioz doesn't say double chord, meaning non divisi <laughs> or divisi. This would be very easy to play non divisi, these octaves. Very simple. Especially since the first violin players have a whole bar and a half to get their hands ready in that upper position. So they just play this and then they move up a half step come back to the E and so on, and then this is all sitting right under the hand. I keep jumping forward into this section. I'll just mention one more thing, and that is, once you learn more about hand positions, then you can see that these positions are actually fairly simple. Things that seem sort of triadic and have relationships of fifths, 
basically just mean that you can move over to the next string using the same position, right? So this could all just depending on the lowest note rather than the highest note. So this note being a G, the next note being a C, the next note being an F, going all the way down to B, not B flat, but B natural. So that's all very simple to just cross over the strings, looking at the strings yourself from right to left. So it's not as difficult as it might seem. Okay, <laughs> let's go back to this. So we talked about this enclosure, okay, and then very simple thirds. These could also be played non divisi even after a nice big run, the hands would go right to the position. The violist has just fingered this G right in here, right? So their finger is on the G, and then this A could be either fingered or open, and then you could just grab that B flat right there. So yeah, it's all, all pretty basic. This, of course, is going to be an octave lower than the G that would sit right under here if you were to just completely score it out in a closed voicing. So G below and then jumping up a tenth to B flat and then jumping up another sixth to G and B flat and then here is where you get the E coming in for the first violin and then D flat in the middle and then E on top. So it really is a widely spaced chord and I feel that this gives the lie to the conception that a tutti chord needs to have everything filled in. That was the Rimsky-Korsakoff dictum, right? That you should always fill in every possible harmonic unit in a chord from the middle of the sound picture upwards. Not to fill it all the way down to the root. Once you get below middle C or below G below middle C, then it just becomes a little too muddy for his particular aesthetic and for mine too. Though there are exceptions that work really, really well. However, a lot of those units are being filled in by other members of the orchestra, as we'll see. So for instance, this G is being doubled by the double basses and the timpani, right? They're, they're both playing that low G. Now, it's a little bit sparse, isn't it? Right in the middle of the sound picture, right around middle C. All we have are the cellos playing this B flat and then a B natural, which they sort of ran up to, right? Okay, so what else is playing that middle area? Well, we've got the bassoons filling in the missing G from our root closed voicing. However, it's really the horns that are playing that entire thing right there. So with the with the help of the bassoons. And right in here, you might be thinking, well, what is going on here, Thomas? Well, just remember your transpositions. You're going to have to learn how to transpose in E flat for most of this work because of the E flat horns and then E flat clarinet, right? So just think about those things. So when you see an E like this, this is a G, right? This is transposing down a major sixth to G. So here's your root, right? So the root of both our G diminished and our G dominant seventh. If this is the root, then this is the fifth, right? So here we go from a diminished fifth to a perfect fifth and back. And then this interlocks down an octave is our transposition for the C or ut horn. So that gives us the G. Here we have the minor third of B flat. Here we have the diminished fifth of sounding D flat. And then the top note is E, which is actually enharmonically supposed to be F flat. And then transitions to the G dominant seventh and then back. Now, one thing that I want you to observe as we go through this first part of the lecture, and that is how often the horns are used for dissonances or transitional chords rather than resolutions. For instance, right in here, and I'll point out some others as we go. It's interesting right in here that it's essentially a very similar chord to what happened in here. It's just that the horns are changing positions this sounding G is being covered by our friend the fourth horn down here. Meanwhile, 
What was the fourth horn doing right in here? They were playing B flat just below middle C. And what is the second horn player playing now? He is actually playing B flat. It's the same exact note for E flat horn. So it just kind of strange how that was changed around. It doesn't really mean anything in particular. The horns could have just stuck to the same exact configuration right in here. But once again, the horns are playing the dissonance rather than the consonants or the resolution. So we've seen that the lower voicing is all filled in, really, just very much the way that Rimsky-Korsakov would have wanted it with this kind of root closed voicing, G, B flat, D flat, E. Then above it, we go to the next G, which is right in here on the violas. Then we've got the B flat, but we don't really have the D flat above that. It's right in here that we get the D flat, and this is actually E with our B flat clarinet. So E, and then right in there, that's A sounding G. This G basically provides the root of the next closed voicing of the diminished chord. G, B flat, D flat, which is doubled here, and then E on top with our flute, which is also doubled below by the first violins. And in fact, that octave is represented here. We got this E, and then this written F sharp sounding E. So those are the octaves that move upwards the same way as the first violins. And then they move back down, the D going back to E, same thing here, this G going back to F sharp, same exact notes sounding. But there is no E octave below, so the second clarinet is filling in the imaginary space right in there. All right, so we took quite a bit of time to break this down, but I just want you to be able to look at these chords and see what they are and understand them without it just being this big vertical blur. Really think about how the chords are constructed and what elements are playing in them. So we just established that we have two stacks of closed voicings. By closed voicing, I mean every single note in a chord is represented from the root to the third to the fifth to the seventh, right? So they're all together in one nice cluster. So we have that here, we have that here, but right in the middle, in between the two, it's just a little neglected, but it doesn't really need to. It doesn't really need to be completely filled in because the ear fills it in. And why is that? Because the body of tone of the horns is so powerful that it just basically fills in what's right above them in terms of an octave. And that's another reason why you don't need to push your horns too high, right? Because they just have these powerful overtones that do the work for you. And pushing your horns too high is really just the most common kind of error that a beginning orchestrator can do. So just really think about this. And I'm not saying you should keep your horns in the basement, but there is so much great scoring within the range of the actual staff. If you just look at the examples presented by the great masters of orchestration, like Berlioz. Now, right in here, let's go back to this. I finally get to explain what is going on here. The strings are basically playing over their strings in the same position, right? Just moving it right and left and then back to the right again. Actually, a fairly simple operation, but very exciting for the audience to hear. And he's giving those strings some backup. Right here, unison clarinets. By the way, don't use the word unison on your wind writing. Use ah too, okay? Because unison could mean anything. Right here, we understand that it means ah too. And that is the way that the publishers for this score chose to score it. But if I had the time, I would erase all of that and put in the word ah too whenever I came across that because I don't want developing orchestrators to see this and say, oh yeah, see, look, it says unison on a wind part. And yet Thomas and Justin, who's got the music engraving tips channel, both say not to say unison. Well, they're wrong because look, Berlioz is right. But that is not the practice. 
Okay, so don't do it. That's all I can say. So this means A2. So A2 clarinets are doubling the second violins, and the second violins, to an extent, are doubling what the first violins are doing, but the first violins just have a less exciting part. They're basically hanging on to those notes, and then the note being held provides harmony for the part which is moving downwards, right? And then the same thing is true going upwards. Say we've got this F being held, which provides harmony for the line of the seconds, which starts to move upwards over it, right? So just, just a very cool idea. And we have the same relationship going on between the cellos and the violas, down a third from the second violins. So the clarinets are basically just supporting what's going on in that line. And then what's interesting here is the flutes are providing the harmonization. They're basically playing an octave above those violas. Now, remember a tip that I recently uploaded once again to the Facebook group, and you may have read it in 100 More Orchestration Tips, and that is the case of the disappearing flute. And this is what we're hearing right in here. Generally speaking, in most interpretations, you will not be able to hear that flute if everybody is doing their job. If the strings are playing furiously and very, very focused, fortissimo right in here, and especially with the flutes diving down into an area where they become invisible, all that they will do is just help the strings to become more radiant. And that's what they're doing, but they're not helping the first violins become more radiant. Here is the cream of the just, as it were. The wonderful innovation of Berlioz is that he is helping to bring out the harmony part of the violas and the cellos. Now, of course, the cellos don't reach all the way up to the same A here. They're playing the A an octave below. But here the cello goes to unison and so on. So this flute is bringing that part out, but it isn't intended to be heard on its own at all. Berlioz is aware that it will disappear into the texture. And of course, just the clarinets right in here will be absorbed by the furious sound of 30 violin players that will just swallow up what the clarinets are doing in here unless they play out, which they shouldn't. Then the bassoons come back in. They help out with the return of the diminished chord, which is re-voiced for the horns coming in right at the end of this, and it ends up resolving to uh, an F major chord. And here we have this beautiful little chorale by our winds, and it's a wonderful contrast from this furious expression right in here. It's the kind of scoring that wasn't unheard of. All of this stuff it fits in well as a progression of the kind of orchestration that was before it. Beethoven, Weber, I would mention Schubert, except Schubert is not an influential orchestrator. His orchestrations would not have really been known to Berlioz. So I'm thinking about those examples that would have fed into Berlioz's perception of orchestration. So we can't really count Schubert because his orchestrations were yet to have been published. In fact, the greatest one of all, his Unfinished Symphony, wasn't published until generations later. So this, I think, is more influenced by Beethoven and Weber, possibly other orchestrators of that period. We have first flute and first clarinet moving at octaves with the little oboe in the middle and a callback to the beating heart under the sudden discovery of Harriet <laughs> that was represented at the first statement of the E-Day fix, right? That da-da, da-da. So we've got kind of a callback to that in the lower strings. And here the E-flat horn is coming in. And this is so cool. And I think there's just a wonderful twist in this, and that is that... By going to A flat in here, we've got this F minor chord, which resolves to C, right? So the A flat is this note that sits right above the G and resolves down to the fifth of our chord that we're resolving to. By using an E flat horn, 
this sounding A flat just fits right into the tonal scheme of the standard natural horn. Uh, just such a wonderful idea. Of course, this could have been corrected to an F sharp or it could have been anything that the composer needed because once you get up into that top octave, a lot of different pitches are available through lip pressure or just a little correction in the bell and other strategies. But still, I think it's such a sweet thing to go up to that A flat right in there that is enclosed by these sounding F octaves. I'm saying sounding because this is a first clarinet playing on a B flat instrument, so this will sound F natural. And meanwhile, the oboe is just playing along <laughs> this beautiful little C right in the middle, just trying to stay placid, transitioning to F minor and coming back to our tonic of C major. And then here we have pretty much the same thing again, and we don't need to belabor this. And the only difference right in here is the first violin playing up an octave and then having the seconds come right back under the way that they were before. We end up with this G diminished seventh going to a G seventh and back, and then the same diving down. All the same, really. Remember Berlioz's passion for Harriet. If you've looked into some of the uh, explanations about what was going on in his personal life, when he finally did resolve his passion for her, they actually did meet, and he was able to convince her that he was head over heels in love with her, and he was a genius. And she sort of said, well, okay then. <laughs> uh, you're kind of cute, and my career is on the downswing, and, you know, I could do worse for the following decade then fall in love with this young man and spend my life in Paris with his success. So that didn't last, of course, because Berlioz was a hopeless romantic. If he achieved his goal, that meant there was something wrong with it. So, yeah, poor Harriet. Almost like she was bamboozled by his self-delusion. But we don't need to get into that. That doesn't have anything to do with orchestration, or does it? We're going to a similar harmonic idea here with a tension and then a resolution. So notice that the horns are once again being used for the tension, but also for the resolution. So they are playing elements that do resolve. But they're all fairly cleverly scored. I don't want you to get sick of me explaining what's going on on the horns, but I just sort of fear that you're going to see it as a missing element, almost as if looking at this score and seeing blankness, right? Not quite understanding what's happening. So I'll explain them as we go. Really, it's the strings kind of talking to the winds. And that leads back to the strings and so on. I really like this little conversation. Berlioz puts lots of things like that into his work. He doesn't make it trivial, like this is just a passage where it goes back and forth a few times. And he doesn't do that everywhere, but I just love the fact that he puts it in. And of course it's not all the winds. Uh, here we have the oboes and bassoons conspiring with the first violins and their melody, and of course the rest of the string section playing measured tremolo. So at the speed that this is going, this is almost an unmeasured tremolo playing 16th notes like that. And of course, this is pretty fast playing those eighth notes in cut time, con fuoco, it's pretty fast. So what is going on with the horns? Here we've got an E third, written E and G, down a major sixth, G minor third, right, that would be G and B flat. And then this is down an octave, so this would be C and E, basically a C seventh chord. We see that in the strings as well, don't we? Here's the G and the B flat. Here's a G, there's a C. Here we've got E. So it's really a C7 over E kind of a chord. And some of those same elements too in the winds. And then things are resolving to F minor. Right? And then we have that F minor chord right in here. Here's the kind of inverted fifth. We've got the dominant and the tonic there, but that's going to sound down an octave, right? And then here we've got written D and F. So what are written D and F? That would be an F minor third in the key of E flat. So a very simple kind of a resolution. What's lovely is that the harmony progresses as it goes forward. 
I don't want to get into it because I think we'll be here forever on this first section of this lecture. But you can work out the rest once you get the knack. Thinking of this open G7 in our horns sounding down an octave, and then what are they filled up with? I think about what is down a major sixth from this G minor third. You can figure it out. So you can see right away this is a G minor seventh chord, and so on. What's cool here is that this becomes really more of a tutti chord, the way that everything is leading, really like a big fortissimo reaction. Fortissimo piano, the conversational winds come in here, and then forte piano, so not as big of a contrast. Then here, pianissimo on this G minor seventh, and then leading towards a sudden fortissimo. So this should not be a crescendo at all. So just suddenly, bam. I think that these really violent contrasts of dynamics are supposed to represent Berlioz's bursts of passion, right? <laughs> but the orchestration in here, it's not as groundbreaking as you might think. It is a progression in terms of scope. And to put all of those progressions of scope together is groundbreaking, <laughs> right? But it's not groundbreaking in the way that Debussy's orchestration was compared to, say, his older contemporaries. I would say the nature of the work is really what's groundbreaking. The way that these progressions of orchestral technique and language were used in the service of an almost purely emotional work. Well, I mean... That's the perception, though, isn't it, right? Actually, an enormous amount of intellect went into this work, as well as Berlioz's passion, right? So the focus is on the passion. In that way, Berlioz is a showman, as well as a confessional artist. Let's not go over this too much, but it's just wind harmonization behind more active, engaged strings. Probably the orchestrational thing to point out here that's interesting is, once again, the flutes are tracking from above, and here they'll be a bit more audible. Once again, unison should be a two. Right in here, we get into this lovely, it's not a fugato, and it's really not all that contrapuntal, like in terms of strict counterpoint, very intellectual counterpoint, that was not Berlioz's style or his interest at all. So I can't really say, okay, well, Berlioz goes to the fugato here, because he doesn't really. Okay, he more has conversations and contrasts of roles, and that's what he's really great at. So just as long as you aren't expecting this perfect intellectual banter, then he does all right. So we have some of that. I just feel that what's worth pointing out here is that similar to the aesthetics of his time, the direction of his time, it's really the strings that do a lot of the leading around that are really saying what needs to be said and are really taking the main role. And that is just sensible orchestration. However, it is so dependent on strings, not to the exclusion of the winds and the brass, but nobody had really imagined that the winds and the brass could take the kinds of roles that they could in later scoring, like in Wagner, right? Not to mention the people that followed Wagner, Mahler, and so on, Strauss. But a lot of that starts here and starts with Weber, like with Weber's operatic scoring. Weber's overtures give you the idea that he is more of a symphonic composer who expanded the language. But if you look at the actual scoring of the opera once the singing starts, that's really where you start to see the innovation, and that would also be worth studying. But digging into a two-hour opera, I think, is just a little bit beyond me. Maybe I could take little excerpts and talk about them, but I couldn't really go through them. It is enough that Berlioz's work here that is worth studying all the way through is like an hour long. That's probably about the longest I'm going to be tackling. This is rather cool, though, with the major weight of the activity right in here. The function is really in the strings, and then we just have these da-da, 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 da-da. Repeated chords happening in the winds, and just really fairly ordinary kinds of voicings, really. A lot of doubling of the top note by first flute and first oboe, but nothing really all that remarkable as we go. But what I really love here is that he pulls it back, pianissimo crescendo, adding rolled timpani 
and once again our horns coming in here <laughs> on the tension rather than the resolution just really pushing and this swirling kind of scoring right in here this is really worth talking about and that is the way that the firsts and the seconds step on each other's toes right so we have this dca followed by c a f sharp and it goes back and forth uh, essentially kind of coming in harmonizing right the the c harmonizes with the a above it and then joins it and then when it hits the f sharp then the first come in and harmonize over that so it, it all works together they're not fighting one another at all but they are playing off of each other in this beautiful cumulative way and meanwhile everybody else is just moving along i love how this is repeating there and then we have these kind of dancing cellos below going back and forth not doubled by anybody so it is classical period scoring with the winds taking the harmonic role behind while the strings do their thing in the front and the timpani build but it's just so titanic the way that it's all put together that it would have felt kind of overwhelming to the audience of its day and of course the winds come in both flutes doubling the first violins and then the oboes filling in the harmony same with the clarinets and that frees up the second violins they don't have to do as much harmony in the middle there that leads to just this sudden drop off which i think is also wonderful even though berlioz has not said pull it back please it's just the sudden nakedness that helps the music to come down there is an inference with dolce that things are softer but it's really up to the conductor at this point how much he wants to pull back these winds right in here and he'll give them the signal to pull back or not or how much so once again remember your clarinet transposition you read a note and it actually sounds down a whole step when the clarinets are in b flat we have this call back to the e day fix ba 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 right so like da 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 right it's a development of that into a different harmonic context it's as if the memory of it is giving him spasms right da 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 right and then just responds da 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 ba da 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 he's fixated on this idea and poor harriet her number is up once again horns playing the transitional chord rather than the resolution i think that's really fun so just you know e sounds g right so these are basically e thirds stacked e thirds sounding down an octave from what you see here in the c horns just really lovely conversation between the winds and the strings and uh, interesting isn't it that the flute and clarinet are playing the octaves but the first violins have enough force that they can just really carry the melody here and of course these lovely swooping cellos right in here are so elegant we have a further development of the e day fix going onwards uh, flutes playing in octaves here they'll be very audible from the way that they're scored they won't disappear into the texture as much until we get right into here and of course we've got other elements of winds that will absorb them turning into octaves playing on top of the first violins there but the first violins themselves are being doubled down an octave by the violas and once again the fervent heartbeat da 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 right so we have that kind of fluttering heartbeat i wonder if berlioz had a heart murmur maybe he did but it all works out very very well and now we come to the first ending of the repeat <laughs> yeah so you have to go all the way back to the e day fix now some orchestras will just skip it and they'll just go straight from here to the second ending on the next screen which we'll look at in a second uh, but <laughs> that is actually kind of telling Berlioz hey okay all right we get it you know that's fine yeah you know you're obsessed over Harriet and that's cool we'll just we'll just get on into the next part of that if that's okay with you uh yeah but ba 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 da 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 and then you know this lovely kind of summing up I really love these pushes here with the sforzando winds and strings right in here
interesting that he doesn't choose to put in the Sforzando in the upper line, right? And if that's true, probably the Sforzando is not going to be put into the first flute and first oboe either, right? Or the first clarinet, which is uh, tracking from an octave below. It's really this second voice right in here that is getting more of the emphasis. Second flute and second oboe doubling, and then the second clarinet playing an octave lower. And those same elements are being doubled right in here in these middle strings. What is rather shocking here is how low Berlioz pushes these flutes. And they really will become invisible when they get down to here. So here I am giving him an evaluation. <laughs> but I would probably say that once they get down to this place right in here, they're going to be inaudible. And especially like this poor second flute player, once they get down to this F sharp, they're going to get swallowed by everything else. The second oboe and the second violins, they're going to thicken the texture slightly. And yeah, maybe it is something nice you can do for the second flute player to be included in the motion of the line. But that doesn't mean that they're doing anything that's all that functional, especially by the time they get to this G, right? There's going to be so much weight on this G from other parts especially with the timpani playing, even held back a little bit at mezzo forte. I love this. Right, it comes in fortissimo piano. It's an accented roll uh, with a really big accent at the beginning and then backing off. So, But even, even at a softer dynamic, it's still going to make the flutes disappear right here, especially with the clarinets and the oboes sitting on top of it. We have reached a beautifully consonant G. This is the reestablishment of the harmony. We have been moving towards this, and now we have achieved our G. And then Berlioz is going to wreck it all by sending us back to C major by turning the G into a G7th, which is the dominant of C on the repeat. Right, so we're going back to C there. So in essence, it is a symphony. This is something that I will talk a little bit more about in the introduction video. The structure really is that of a symphony, and this is an allegro, and maybe that's just because it's expected of him, a sonata allegro. So he is shaping his passions into that familiar form, and that helps to guide the audience as well and make the work more acceptable. But if he weren't held back by those boundaries, where would his imagination have taken his sense of form? I think it's sufficient, though, to note that he used the form in such an original and striking way as it was. So I have no problems with him sticking to the Sonata Allegro to the extent that he does. So let's have a listen to all of those things, right? So going through everything just notice the dominant role of the strings throughout even when things get into very intense orchestration like this where you've got your octaves right in here that are basically stacked thirds and then moving together in harmony like this in both parts with a harmony voice becoming more and more dominant and how that is all doubled in winds and so on and so forth and nice punchy brass right in here, these horns and timpani. Even at all that, the strings really are the dominant factor. But the winds do have their own role to play in terms of the contrast, in terms of being the instruments that sometimes introduce something new or take the music in a particular direction. Listen for how certain dynamic elements just punch right out to express certain emotional things. That is certainly a romantic development from Beethoven that Berlioz takes even further. And I feel it's really operatic in a sense that Berlioz is saying something in more of a theatrical sense than in a symphonic sense. We see that same sense of conversation here. Ba ba da ba ba. Then strings da 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 da. So listen for all of those ways that sometimes they wrap up and then conspire together, right? You know, and here you can hear how the strings really carry the main expression of the functions. And a lot of times the winds are just basically playing harmony or 
harmonic rhythm. And once again, professions of love, of passion. Is it really love, though? I mean, is it the obsession is inspiring feelings of affection, but the affection is somewhat uh, exaggerated and kind of disturbing. So, you know, is that really love? But anyways, the bursts of passion that he feels right in here. It's just written right into the dynamics, right? Listen for that as well. And this big, huge rushing up to these two T chords that we kind of atomically broke apart. Then, of course, how the flute doubles from an octave above the harmonization rather than the upper voice, which is doubled by the clarinet, and how that works. So listen for all of those elements, and then I promise the second half of this lecture will be quite a bit shorter. Now for the second part, and as promised, this is going to be a lot shorter. I'll be covering three or four pages, but what is there to discuss is really easy to absorb. A lot of this Berlioz orchestration, while groundbreaking, as I've mentioned before, is really not all that complex, but it does have the roots of a lot of our modern orchestration approaches, and is actually a pretty good first score to study. I might have mentioned that this is a good work to study in other intro to score reading kinds of videos. Starting here, bar 166, violas, double basses, and cellos all come in together in this triple octave. You have to remember that when the cellos and double basses are stuck together like this, that they represent an octave, right? So we've got our stacked octave. And this is wonderfully effective. A statement of the E-Day fix going into the next part of the symphony. If we remember our symphonic construction, our Sonata Allegro, we have just established the dominant as our middle of the movement tonality. Right? So now we have to work our way back to C somehow. I won't get into that too much, but it's quite fascinating and fun. And I'll point a few things out as we go. Okay, but we're now in the key of G, more or less. And Berlioz is going to restate the E day fix. Ba, 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 da. And in this context, it is sort of pushing away from G. So even though <laughs> there's this huge row of measured tremolo Gs in our violins, and think in cut time going fast, this is really fast. This is yaka daka 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 daka. Just really, really, really fast. I mean, even faster than I was just saying just then. So just really be aware of how fast cut time is. And that's why we're covering many more pages like. You know, for the WC, I might cover like one or two screens, uh, and here I might cover like eight screens just to cover the same amount of time. Okay, so going up to this E flat, you know, just and then we have the response from our winds. Basically, once again, the firsts are all playing together. First clarinet and oboe doubling right there with the flute above and then the horns below so right this is sounding D flat down a major sixth from B flat is D flat right okay and so it's just a simple octave right in here 
triple octave, responding to the triple octave of the lower strings. And I love the way that it just sort of collapses, kind of falls over itself right there at the end of the line. And then violas and double basses and cellos come in and they take everything up a step, right? So they're starting up on A flat instead of G. And yet the G's, these pedal G's remain relevant. And it's just basically pushing the harmony up each time up a half step. So A flat and then A natural. And each time we have our winds kind of reacting the same way but then progressing the harmony going forwards. The third coming in here to help falling down. It's easier right in here for the third to play over the necessary notes, right? The C, A, E because in order to get those same notes, the E-flat player would have to really play a few stopped notes and, and it might sound kind of unpleasant, right? So it's just easier for the C player to continue on the line. Just another example of teamwork that you would see between natural horns back in the day. Now our little bass solo keeps climbing and climbing, and as it does, the unison <laughs> off four bassoons come in here and really add a huge amount of thickness to it, right? So this is going to be playing in the middle of our triple octave. But notice that the violas drop down to the level of the cellos once they get to a certain point here. And that bass part really does become more of a bass line and less of a melodic line. Really, it just becomes almost like an Alberti bass kind of a pattern. And then our little elements here become more and more melodic statements rather than reactions, little bits and pieces. And then, of course, the growing presence here of the strings. And I really love these accented bars, right? Going so fast with the measured tremolo in cut time. It really is just like adding an accent to the beginning of the bar and then and then going diminuendo each time. Uh, what could be a more romantic period kind of dynamic expression than that, you know, just pushing and then drawing back, pushing and then drawing back, you know, just why the palpitations of my heart for you, Henrietta, right? So it's that, that same kind of, kind of passionate outburst pulling back each time. So right in the middle of all of these repetitions and the reactions becoming more and more melodic of our upper winds. We've got the horns playing in here, E octaves, right? And then written E octaves are sounding G, right? So this is stacked E thirds. And as the harmony progresses, the horns jump in there each time to just push at the beginning of the bar and Notice that they can basically state different positions that are really easily playable for them as natural horns. And the ear of the listener does not really distinguish that the chords have moved around in the background. I mean, mezzo forte, right? Mezzo forte accent, so you get a punch at the beginning, but really the the sound here of the of the strings is going to cover a lot of the changes of voicing that will be behind all of this. And of course, like our little bass line right in here is doing the opposite dynamically. And that I would say is more of a Berlioz thing, maybe something that 
might occur in a more operatic context that is being put into a symphony here. So the pushing and drawing back, the shoving forwards with each bar. I just try to score this out in uh, in Sibelius and listen to the playback, and it'll just turn into this huge mess. All right, so. Now here, this chord is so loud. It's just so enormously loud. And to make it even more loud, there's absolutely no need to play divisi here. Uh, this all works non-divisi. Octaves, sixths, thirds, right? Those are the easiest intervals to play for our doughty members of the string section. So if they really want to show everybody what they can do, and you'll hear in the recording that I'm using that they really just play out and they're huge. This is a trick taken from Beethoven, really taken to its extreme, you know. Um, it is the it is this big old G seventh chord, which is going to resolve back to C. Right, so that was really easy, wasn't it? We got back to C major, and basically octaves with harmonization from the lower winds. So how does this work? We've got flutes. Uh, scored out as octaves, they are being doubled by oboes on the lower step, on the lower voice, and then it turns into simple octaves between the oboes and flutes. And the clarinets and bassoons are uh, playing the next octave down but harmonizing and that's all very very cool. And here the strings don't even attempt to harmonize at all the way that the winds did. We just have our violin, first and second violin octaves, second violins doubled by the violas, and then an octave below that, the cellos. So it's all just one big long octave passage. And then we just get to this big punch here <laughs> of this big G major chord right in here. And <laughs> then you are ready to start the next slightly obsessed and psychotic passage of this symphony. So let's stop there. Listen for all of those things. The harmonization of the winds right in here and I like the way the functions sort of change around in here to make things more interesting. But then just these soaring strings right in here that don't need any help at all. And of course, speaking of not needing help, this wonderful punchiness right in here of G turning into our dominant chord leading back to C. And then like this wonderful progression of the harmony forwards, it's just really nicely done. The bassoons joining in with the lower strings here and the lower strings telescoping down to the violas doubling the cellos and so on really really great scoring and this actually pushes the bases up quite high right they tell you to keep the bases up well the bases can go up pretty far up to this G is a pretty good limit but you know they can even go up to A and B flat and so on it just depends on whether or not you're giving them enough time and the music is scored well listen for the reversals of dynamics in here the way that the forte you have this forte diminuendo to piano and the piano diminuendo to forte and the little um, the little reactions of the winds turning into their own thing pushing forwards to the upcoming uh, big string tutti and then how this all started right with the pedal G's being played measured tremolo very very fast and the E day fix starting everything off, which is something to develop from, going up a half step each time, the kind of the reactions of the winds and horn in octaves, and so on. So enjoy all of that, and I will see you again in a couple of days with the next part 
where Berlioz just really cuts loose. 